Everybody. Welcome to the BDC podcast. It's so great to have you with us today. And today's very special because um, I have my first guest ever on the BDC podcast and how appropriate that it would be my wife. And so Michelle is here in Buffalo from Honduras for uh, actually got she got to spend several weeks with the family. And uh, we thought what we would do is over the next several podcasts, we would tell the story of Love Honduras. And so we're going to start out with um, with you, Michelle, and you're going to spend the next couple of podcasts talking about um, Montagna de la Fleur and some different things. And then we're looking forward to it because um, Michaela is going to uh, join us as well. And then uh, Hector, uh, who's uh, on staff with you at mm-hmm. Love Honduras, is going to join us. And so really, we're um, this is really great because um, a lot of people know what we're doing in Honduras, um, but they haven't heard the whole story. And they... and uh, we, we and they they don't maybe even understand why we're so passionate mm-hmm. about it. And um, one thing that people know about the Dream Center is we're passionate about reaching the lost in missions. Yeah. But why Honduras and and why did we end up there, especially when we spent all those first years going to what we we call the ten forty window, mm-hmm. which uh, is where most of the unreached people are um, in uh, India and Pakistan and Nepal and Sri Lanka and you know places in Asia. And then I'll have to admit it right here live on the podcast. Mm-hmm. I said, why are you going to Honduras? You know, and I was, you remember that? Yeah, I, remember. I was like, why, what is going on? And, and, uh, but now we know why. And it's an awesome story of God's hand and following the direction of the Holy Spirit. And, mm-hmm. uh, so, uh, Michelle, I just want you to share, um, because there's so much to share, but let's share in this episode, um, how did we end up? on Montagna de la Flor, ministering to the Tulipan Indian tribe who had never heard the gospel. How did that come about? And and so what's the story behind it? All right, which I think is an awesome story and not everybody's heard it. So, yeah. Well, 13 years ago, I went on my first trip to Honduras and uh, I asked myself the same question. Why am I going to Honduras? I didn't really understand it, but I kept just being obedient to God and taking trips. And then one day, nine years ago, when I was in Honduras leading a team in a small village um, near Montani de la Flor, a Tulipan Indian walked through our outreach. And I didn't even really understand who he was or anything at that time, but I noticed that he had no shoes on his feet and he had these big baskets he was carrying around with him. And he had told us he had walked five hours that day just to come to where we were. And so we found shoes for him. We bought his baskets. He said his uh, by buying his baskets, then it would help provide food for his family. And he told us about the place that he lived called Montagne de la Flor. And he told us that there was a lot more people there like him. And right there in my heart, I knew that we were supposed to go there, but I didn't know how and he said it was hard to get there because there were rivers so that was all we really knew about the place so we gave our phone number to him and we said go home back to your people and have your leader call us to invite us to come and if he invites us then we'll come so sure enough the next day we got a phone number from his leader inviting us to come to Montagne de la Flor so the people that I was working with we packed up our trucks 
and we said we're gonna go find Montani de la Flor and we found a place in that village a person in that village who could guide us to the mountain mm. we picked him up on the way and he took us to Montani de la Flor but the one thing was is we couldn't go there in a bus we couldn't go there in normal cars we had to rent special four-wheel drive trucks in order to get there because we had to cross rivers and drive through mountains and on roads that uh, were not really roads they were like paths through the forest and so and we arrived in a tribe called San Juan this is where that man was from and when we arrived there the people were really really shy and they wouldn't talk to us they just kind of like stared at us like who are these people I don't know maybe some of them have never even really seen a white person before I don't really know mm. and you know when I went um, the first time I was really excited because I'm like we're going to take the gospel to Montani to the floor and it's gonna be easy because we have an awesome program and everybody's gonna get saved and everything but when we got there the people weren't open they weren't mm. open to the gospel they didn't really trust us they wouldn't let us pray for them when we preached the Word of God they just stared at us when we asked who wanted to receive Jesus Nobody put their hand up. It was really different than what I thought was going to happen. Hmm. They were really happy that we brought food for them, but they just kind of took their food and then like ran away from us. So they were really, really shy. And so we um, just went there for the day and we left and I was praying like, God, if you want me to work here and keep going there, like you've got to show me what to do. And so um, then um, the week passed and that team left and another team came in. And one of my favorite ministries that we do in, hus in um, Honduras is a hospital ministry. We go into a government hospital where the conditions are really, really bad for the mm. people. And we pray and we minister to the families, the patients. We pray for healing. We like encourage them. Sometimes we uh, take some food and bless them because in the hospital, they don't give the families food. They only give them medicine medical care mm. and so we were in the hospital with the next team we were praying for people giving out food and a nurse said to me really randomly did you know the chief from Montani to the floor is in the hospital and I knew it was God because she didn't know that we had been the week before and she didn't know me and so like why would she say that to me but as soon as she said it I said to my friend we have to find the chief we have to find him. So we asked until we found out what room he was in. And it ended up that he was like on the top floor and there's no elevator in this hospital. So here we are climbing up like 16 flights of stairs to go visit the chief from Montani to the floor. And I had not met him the week before when we had been in the mountain. Mm. But when we got to his room, he was laying in the bed. I didn't know anything about him, but I learned that he was like 112 years old. Wow. When we got to his room and we walked in the door, he started pointing at us and smiling like he had seen us before. This appointment was like a divine appointment from God. And so with my friend who translated for me, he began to talk and she told me that he was a Christian, but he had just given his life to the Lord. And he said to us, he said, my people on my mountain, they need to know about Jesus. Somebody needs to tell them about Jesus. Mm. And then he said, and somebody needs to help them. They're really poor. They don't have food. He's like, I'm really concerned for my people. And I knew in that minute, that was a confirmation that God had called me to Montani to the floor. So I looked him in the eye and I said, I promise that I'll go to the mountain and I'll tell your people about Jesus mm. and I'll do whatever I can to help your people. And um, then with that, we prayed together. Uh, we talked a little bit more. And um, you could tell he was really happy because he was smiling and everything as we were talking with him. And I said to my friend, I said, leave our phone number because if he needs anything, then maybe we can come back and help him. Because again, that hospital being the type of hospital it is, doesn't pay for like your medicine or any extra things you need. Right. So in my mind, I was just like, you know, we could be a blessing to him. Maybe if he needs some medicine or you need something, we can pay for it. So uh, she left her phone number and she she gave it to the nurse and she told the nurse call us for anything anything you need anything happens please give us a call and so about four hours later she called us and told us that the chief had passed away so you just met him by divine appointment mm -hmm. just by the leading of the holy spirit yeah. and then um promised him that you would take the gospel to his mountain yeah mm-hmm 
And that that must have been all he was waiting for. I believe it. And was. then because then he died just, after that, yeah. just knowing that mm-hmm. okay, I have the promise from somebody that someone's going to take care of my people and share yeah. the gospel. I mean, you can't them. make. I mean, that's like a Hollywood movie. You can't make this up. No. This is like no. this is like a, this really happened. Yeah. And when you tell the story, it's like really, yeah, you know. And so, and uh, I don't even think I realized at the time what what I was getting into, no, of course, or not. what yeah. kind of a commitment. Yeah. But just in the moment, I knew that God was in it. Like the right. whole thing, us being in the hospital at the right day, day the right time, being led to His room. Why would a nurse just randomly tell me that Kasike is in the hospital? Yeah, you know, and talking to him. And so after, so after we got notification that he died I decided right away we need to take another trip to the mountain so that week at the end of the week um, we decided to rent trucks again we packed up our trucks again and we went this time we decided we'd spend two nights in the mountain and we visited two other communities La Ceva and La Lima on that trip in the mountain and we preached the gospel and again it wasn't easy to preach the gospel in the mountain it was really challenging uh, the people in the mountain again they didn't trust us um in the one community we went to that was a little more remote than the first two communities the people actually hid in the trees and behind the trees because they were like really (laughs) afraid of us yeah and like who we were and why were they in our community they were not used to having guests in their community um but um we were able to begin to plant seeds in montagna de la flor um through those two trips and begin to discover a lot about the mountain And so then for a lot of years, I just made it our goal that at least one trip every year would be dedicated to Montagne de la Flor. And we would go for three to five days to the mountain and that we would work in um, certain communities and begin to build a relationship with the people and begin to minister to the people. So that's what we did for a lot of years. We would go to the mountain Mm -hmm. for one week and we would preach the gospel. We would do programs like a kids club program. So everybody in the community would have fun and hear the gospel message and um, and give an altar call, give an opportunity for people to receive Jesus. But for a lot of years, people in the mountain were really nervous and really like, you know, they didn't really respond, you know, to some people would get saved and give their life to Jesus and want prayer, but not a lot of people who are really pioneering the gospel. Yeah, the you're really going, I mean, you're going to an unreached place. Mm-hmm. It's a hard place mm-hmm. and you're pioneers yeah. because uh, nobody else had exactly. been doing that. Now, while you were, uh, the first little bit while you were, because I remember mm-hmm. uh, while you were doing this, you thought there was like three or four communities on the mountain right. and that's in that and you thought you'd been to everywhere right. where there was people right. but that's right. not the case right. so how many communities now have you discovered by just and I, I know Hector we're going to hear from Hector in a few weeks but Hector's been a big part of that about just taking the four-wheel drive truck and driving through what right. looks like a road mm-hmm. and how many communities are there on the mountain that you know of right now? There's, um, well, I have in my phone a list of over 60 communities, but there's more communities than that. We had a lot to learn about the mountain. The mm. mountain's almost like another nation, another culture. Um, it's a people group. Um, uh, in, it's the first indigenous people group, the original indigenous people group of Honduras. And so it's run totally different. Like they have uh, chiefs, they have presidents in Uh, vice presidents and secretaries for every community and every community that we go into we need to have permission from all of the leaders before we can work there Mm. and we discovered that if we don't have the full permission of the leaders of each community that people won't open their doors to us and they won't welcome us and they won't come to our meetings so what we've learned about the mountain is there's five tribes in the mountain and then every tribe uh, owns communities. Okay. So one tribe may own like 15 or 20 communities. They're like under that tribe. Right. And so we've one of the things we've had to do be- be- besides pioneering the gospel in the mountain is build a relationship with all of the leaders, mm-hmm. all of the chiefs, all of the presidents, the uh, boards of all of the communities and all of the leaders and like the key people in the mountain. We've had to take a lot of time to build their trust and build a relationship. And as we've built more of a trust and a relationship with the leaders, the people in the mountain have become more and more open to us coming and more and more open to hearing the gospel and have begun to really respond to the gospel. And now we're seeing a revival in the mountain. Well, okay, so tell us about that. So you you pull up into a community, 
they're hiding behind trees. They're afraid of you. They don't know. They, they're not responding to the, mm -hmm. they're, they're taking the food because mm -hmm. they're hungry. Mm -hmm. And, and really many are start, were starving on mm -hmm. the mountain. I've held a little kid that I knew was starving the one time that I was there. Um, but you, they're not, they're, they're really not receptive to you now, but that's years ago. So tell about it now. Mm -hmm. Tell about the difference now. Mm -hmm. For example, campfires are yeah. something that you do on the mountain. A campfire, I, um, for the people that are listening, they, you know, at night they make a campfire, invite everybody to come, and they, they worship around the campfire. Mm -hmm. There's preaching, there's praying for the sick, and then there's fun things like roasting marshmallows, yeah. which they would never get to do and stuff like that. So um, the first campfires, I was at some of the first ones where um, people did – did not respond at all. People need prayer, but when you ask them to raise their hand, nobody raises their hand mm -hmm. for prayer. So mm -hmm. tell the difference now. Okay. No, okay. Yeah. What it was like then when nobody responded to now when you do a campfire, okay. for example. Well, one of the things that God spoke to me when I was praying about working in the mountain was um, because I was like, and I always told my teams we're going to take the love of Jesus to the mountain. Mm. But one of the things that God spoke to me was, how do they know my love when they don't even know what love is? Mm. Like it was obvious by the way they responded when you tried to hug them that they didn't even understand what love meant. They didn't understand how to like love me as a person or how to love their kids or how to understand love. So the first thing that we had to do that God spoke to me was we had to show them what love was. Mm -hmm. We had to teach them what human love was and then they could understand the love of God. And so really the first thing that we began to do even before uh, really successfully preaching the love of God to them was to love on them, love on them, love on them, hug them, visit them there in their homes. Um, and so sometimes what we did at campfire when nobody responded, I would just tell my team, I want you to go pray for everybody. I want you to go up to them. I want you to hug them while you pray for them. I want you to um, like just speak the love of Jesus over their life. And so there was a lot of times when we would do campfires and we would do kids clubs and all of my team would just go out and they would mm. love on the people you know we would pray be praying over them but we would just be like declaring um like things broken over their life and declaring the love of jesus would come and would fill them and when we did it we we would like love them like we would embrace them we would hug them and you could see that that little by little broke down the barriers in their life and then all of a sudden it was like they began to receive love yes and then when we would show up in their community they would come to us and start to hug us they would like come yes. running to us and hug us and even in the communities that where we still the people are a little bit more shy because they're more remote because the more remote you go the more shy the communities are they still when they see us now they'll come running and sometimes they'll just stand in front of us like waiting for a hug you know they won't like reach out to hug us but you can see how the love of Jesus has affected them but it took time they had to understand what love was so the most important thing first was that we showed them what love was. So not only did they learn how to love you, and they do, it's worth it to go to Honduras just to go up the mountain with you, <laughs> in my opinion, because when you get out of the truck, when it pulls up into a village, all the people come running and they hug you. And, mm -hmm. they, and to me, that's got to be a great feeling for you as mm -hmm. well. But then, uh, but they learn how to love you, and then they learn how to love Jesus. Yes. Because now, when you go to a campfire, mm -hmm. there's dancing around the campfire, yes. there's singing around yeah. the campfire. There's, it's right. Yeah, and the everybody atmosphere wants, is totally yeah. different. And everybody wants prayer yeah, for right. things. Nobody <laughs> wanted prayer. Now everybody wants. Sometimes prayer. they don't even wait until we give the opportunity to end to pray. <laughs> Sometimes they'll come running up in the middle of our message. Can you pray for me? Pray for my family. Pray for this. Pray for that. I've had women walk like four hours yes. to find me in the mountain because their baby's sick or they need prayer for somebody in their family and they'll like bring their sick baby and Michelle, can you pray for my baby? They're sick. And wow. the cool thing is, is we always see Jesus heal them and touch them. And yeah. I mean, God you're seeing miracles too. It's, you know, um, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, the team there's, we're going to talk about in our next podcast, the, the how teams come up the mountain mm -hmm. and we, I want to talk about, the feeding program mm -hmm. because we haven't even touched on that because mm -hmm. that was the next thing that God put in your heart yeah. and that we're working along with feed the hungry uh, with, and we're just have all these different ways. We're mm -hmm. reaching people, even painting all their schools yeah. and um, doing work projects mm -hmm. and 
uh, which is all a part of missions. Mm -hmm. But the most important part is that you're bringing the gospel yeah. to the mountain, and that God and that mountain is literally being transformed oh, yeah. by mm -hmm. the power of God, which is really incredible to mm -hmm. see because most people listening here couldn't they wouldn't have the privilege of seeing it from beginning to end yeah, right. but um or from the beginning until now yeah um even the first church sunday church service that and we don't have time in this podcast to tell the whole story of the pastor that has a church yeah. but how many people showed up Six, for that first sunday service 600 600 and people people walked for three and four hours to go to church to go yeah because they I, don't have cars in the mountain they gotta yeah. walk through pass in the mountain unbelievable so Listen, if you're listening to this podcast today or watching, God is transforming this mountain. Amen. It's just one of the things that we're doing in Love Honduras. You're going to hear throughout this whole series about many different aspects of the ministry in Love Honduras. But the premier ministry really is the mountain right now because God is, we're bringing the gospel to places where they've mm -hmm. never heard about Jesus and miracles are mm -hmm. happening. And that is God's heartbeat. Amen. So here's my challenge. What are you going to do? Hey, what are you going to do to help us to reach people for Jesus? We need you. We can't, we, right. we really can't do it without mm -hmm. the uh, other Christians, Christians in North America mm -hmm. that are going to say, hey, we're going to do this. Some people will say, well, what, America has many needs. Why are we there? Listen, at the Dream Center, we're doing both. Amen. We're, we're, mm -hmm. and Jesus mm -hmm. told the church before he ascended into heaven mm -hmm. to be witnesses. In Samaria, Judea, and the, right. uh, throughout mm -hmm. the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. Not in order like that, but simultaneously. Yes. While you're reaching your backyard, you're reaching the world. Amen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, I could get preaching, but we've run out of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we uh, thank you for watching today. Mm -hmm. The QR code is there for you. So that when you uh, use that QR code, it'll bring you to all the websites, our Love Honduras website, our Buffalo Dream Center website, all the ways you can give by Venmo or PayPal or whatever. And um, our Facebook pages, everything is there so that you can give and you can be a part of what God is doing. Also, you can uh, be a part of a missions team. Mm -hmm. That is on our website. You can fill out an application, be a part of one of the teams this year that's coming to Honduras. And in the next episode, we're going to talk about sponsoring kids that are hungry. And you can do that for a very low cost, you can help feed a child. I'm Montanya De La Flor. Yes. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching today.